Hello everyone, I'm Wendell Jones and welcome to this edition of our program Jones and Company. On this program we look at the national issues of the Bahamas and it is budget time in our politics in our country and there are a whole lot of issues uh, that we can talk about today in the political firmament of our country and uh, we are pleased to have as our guest on the program today the chairman of the Progressive Liberal Party and the opposition uh, leader in the Senate, Senator Fred Mitchell. Senator Mitchell, of course, many people know is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Immigration and uh, served as Member of Parliament for Fox Hill. Senator, welcome to the program. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, pleased to be here. Good to see you. Godfrey Ines, nice to have you here as usual. Thank you. Uh, Senator, you, uh, I'm told that you make um, regular trips to Grand Bahama. Yeah. Um, you uh, are eyeing a seat in Grand Bahama? Uh, no, um, just uh, I plan ultimately to move there. I mean, if you talk about retirement, that's where I'd, I'd like to get a home there. Is that it's, right? it's, it's a long time I've been trying to do that, uh, so I'm ser actively searching around for a place because mm. that's where I'd like to go. I, I think Freeport is really a fantastic and amazing place. And I can't understand really why it doesn't take off. I mean, I have my own ideas about politically and economically why it doesn't take off. But that's, that's to me, the future of the Bahamas. And I wish more people would see it. Land is cheap. Uh, housing is cheap. Uh, I think the one area of concern would be health care. They need a proper upgraded hospital. And so, uh, but that's what we're all working on. I would have thought that uh, given your love for Exuma, you would uh, prefer to retire in Exuma. That would be the summer capital. You know? I yes, see. when summer comes, we all decamp to, uh, to Georgetown. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. But um, generally in, in uh, the Progressive Liberal Party now, I know you've been having regular news conferences uh, and um, our... A media organization here. We've been following a whole lot of things that you do. You put out um, many press releases and uh, you have been uh, criticized by some in the media for getting involved in a whole lot of issues that uh, in, in recent times. What's your response? Well, you know, sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. I thought it was extraordinary that uh, the, the, the Nassau Guardian gave an editorial saying the PLP is simply putting out too many statements. I mean, this is, a, this is an organization that sells information. That's how they make money. And they're saying, we're providing you with information, and you're saying, oh, it's too much, it's too much, it's too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, I, I decided the, the main role of the chairman of the PLP uh, under the existing constitution is to actually shape the public image and to defend the party in public. So uh, it is necessary to provide information and it's not only to answer whatever the FNM is doing, it's also to provide information to our supporters mm -hmm. so that when they are in their watering holes in the evening and they or the barber shops, they can answer any point. And if they need to find information about a particular point, they know where to look for it. Uh -oh. And that's really what we're trying to do. How do you think the PLP is doing now? Um, if the since we last met, the uh, governing party celebrated its second anniversary uh, as the government of the Bahamas. Um, how is the PLP faring? Uh, we're uh, neck and neck with the FNM, uh, which is a remarkable turnaround. Uh, the problem, I think, is that the surveys are showing that p there's an imponderable because there is a segment of the population that's fairly sizable that still hasn't made up its mind. So we're fighting for those people. But, you know, we're evenly matched, uh, and uh, the trend is toward the PLP. There's no question about that. Mm. Okay. So, what, what is, Mr. Mitchell, what, what is the, the psychological state of the PLP in terms of morale? Uh, I think that uh, morale is good, but fragile uh, in this sense that the FNM did a number uh, with their media friends uh, on sapping the confidence of the supporters. Um, and so the immediate job we had, those of us who were charged with leading in these circumstances after the uh, election in, in May 2017, was to restore the confidence of people that this could be done again. 
Uh, it's not very difficult because the base uh, knows that you know there's an African ethos that you cannot suppress in the Bahamas. It's always going to remain there, and you build on that. Uh, the fact that there's been a struggle against these forces, which the FNM represents, and we have to continue that historic struggle. What, what concerned me was uh, was not only this uh, that that uh, we had this issue of the confidence, but the FNM has now decided to appropriate even the national holidays like National Heroes Day and, uh, and Majority Rule Day. And I'm watching them very carefully to be sure that they don't rewrite the script. Uh, you know, it was an egregiously, uh, 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 an egregious decision, in my view, uh, to make uh, Roland Simonet a national hero. And that's part of trying to rewrite the record of the country. And so that's the struggle. The, the last uh, defense that the PLP has is its legacy. And we're not going to allow people to attack that and rewrite the history. And I think our kids are now getting the message as they see what is actually happening. Uh, and uh, so we're back on the way. Is the history really, um, for many young people, uh, relevant? And, and, and I, uh, I ask that because uh, I work with a lot of young people who seem not to be interested uh, in political history, whether it's history of the PLP or the Free National Movement. Um, they want to talk about current situation, contemporary issues. Uh, uh, and and, and um, um, most of them were not even uh, around when Lyndon served as, as Prime Minister. Yeah, I, 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 I grant you that. I mean, the anecdotal evidence, a friend of ours, a common friend of ours was telling us the other day that uh, he was taking someone in a car and uh, he was passing this house. And he said, oh, that's where former prime, you know, that's where prime, um, Hubert Ingram lives. And the person said, who is Hubert Ingram? Mm. I mean, this is a man who was prime minister in, in our lifetime. And, you know, the person didn't, didn't know. So there is that. But what I find is, and, and, and we are trying to force history down, down people's throats, but I find that when you engage in a one-on-one -on -one basis or in small groups and you start talking about why policies are what they are and why we should go in a particular direction, there's this view, well, how did that actually happen? And you get the opportunity to say, well, it happened like this. I think that's, that's the thing. We don't want the history to dominate what happens today. What we do want, though, is for them to have the ability to defend themselves when they see something coming at them, which is discriminatory, that they'll know exactly what it is and know how to defend themselves against it. Mr. Mitchell, we've noticed on Mendes programs, issues of day and on point, right? There's an obvious lack of knowledge in the electorate about how our government operates. Yes. A man, a man the other day uh, sent me a voice note, or someone sent me a voice note saying, these shadow ministers, they get paid for doing nothing. <laughs> and, uh, what if, <laughs> so, uh, someone had to, so, says, can you tell me what a shadow minister does? And I, you know, I had to explain, well, a shadow minister actually shadows the portfolio of the minister. Mm -hmm. And of course, the government itself doesn't understand how it operates either. But, you know, it's our job to watch what's happening with the portfolio, mm -hmm. to raise the issues with people. And we, we don't get paid for it. It's just, it's, it's a, it's just a convention mm -hmm. of the Constitution. So, yeah, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of that people don't yeah, understand. Yeah, but, but, but that, that, is, a, that, that is, 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 indicates to me that we have a flawed democracy. Um, but it's not a, an unusual problem for countries. I think you'd find this uh, everywhere. What, what, what happened, I think, is there was a shift in, uh, in the education system at one point where uh, instead of people getting this kind of comprehensive liberal arts education that, uh, that, was the, uh, that came out of the Second World War, essentially, that people should be broadly educated and then move towards something specific. Um, the tide turned somewhere around the 1980s and 90s where people said, all I want is something to prepare me for a job so that once I get out, I can find work. And there's a funny story that, uh, that uh, George Mackey records in his book where uh, two men come to speak to their class at Government High. And one of them is A.F. Adley. <clears throat> so A.F. Adley comes along and he says, uh, 
you know, now boys and girls, uh, you know, or boys that, you know, you have to prepare yourself to do great things when you leave here. You have to be able to serve your country. You have to be able to make a contribution to the common good. You know, my words, not his. Um, so that was A.F. Hadley. L.W. Young comes along and says, you must be able to find work when you get out of here. So while you're in school, you better learn a skill so that once you get out of school, you can find work. So it's the old struggle, like in the States, between W.B. Du Bois, who said, you know, you must lift yourself up uh, out of poverty, and uh, Booker T. Washington, who says, you've got to have a skill. Mm -hmm. I think there's a meeting in between. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, uh, we, 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 we are not an issue-oriented people, you know. We are very emotional. How, how, how is some of these salient issues that are negatively impacting the growth and development of our country, how are you going to get those over to the electorate? Well, I think rationality is always the answer. And, uh, and you know, this is, this is one of the appeals that, uh, that, that I've always made. Uh, we had this example, for example, these two young men who, were, who died in Turin. And one of the, in talking to the parents of these two young men, um, the concern was all of these, this back chat that was going. Um, someone even wrote a column in the Tribune about, you know, you've got you've to look at evidence before you make decisions. And there's all this, you know, stuff floating around. And the evidence simply wasn't there to support it. And so you had to keep saying, look, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, right? Let's wait to see what the facts are. And I think that that's, that's something we've had to say to our supporters throughout the time we've been in this position post-2017, uh, is that uh, because there was this attack on our will that the FNM was able to jump up um, and make one allegation after the next, after the next, and people would wilt and go wobbly. And then you say, but hang on a second, you have to hear the other side. And then as soon as the other side comes out, they say, oh, I see, I see. So I think you just have to keep appealing but, but, but to Mr. it. Mr. in all fairness, we didn't hear the other side. Well, let's... Even the PIP never responded to the allegations made by the FNM, particularly well, the allegations of corruption? Well, I can speak, I can speak post-2017. I can speak post-2017. The one example I remember is Brave Davis, the leader of the party. An allegation was made about a contract that he gave to his brother at BC. Big headlines in the newspaper. But the next day, the facts came out that as soon as he was made aware of it, it was canceled. So there was no contract issued to his brother. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. Now you see, for example, a Diagula. He's now, what is this, the third or fourth occasion which he's going to have to eat crow because he simply did not have the facts. The, the last example, of course, is this ridiculous allegation about Western Airlines and how the PLP did this and the PLP that. All of it has turned out to be patently false. Patently false. He attacks Ian Poitier. He attacks Pat Mortimer. All of which was false information and had to be walked back. And the, the problem, of course, is with the FNM is even in the face of the facts, which, which you put before them. They refuse. They just say, no, nah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Mm. Are, are you concerned, Mr. Miller, uh, Mr. Mitchell, that um, the PLP is too much on the defensive even two years uh, after having lost the election? You're defending uh, your record uh, on, on an ongoing basis, uh, defending um, yourselves against um, allegations. Uh, if you continue to be on the defensive, uh, are you gaining ground? Uh, I think we have gained ground uh, through the reflection of time, but also through the construction efforts that are taking place behind the scenes. The beauty of a media that opposes you is they never pay attention to what you're doing. So, for example, uh, I've recently, we've been doing some work in Grand Bahama, mm -hmm. and we uh, issued a statement up there because uh, they said that the PLP has no presence, it's, uh, you know, nobody knows anything about the PLP in Grand Bahama. But I said, well, look, you know, you're invited to come to our meetings. You're, you get the press statements, you never use them, you never come. So you would know what the PLP is doing in Grand Bahama. Is that that uh, work is, is beginning to, to change. I mean, and this is a difficult climb back. Uh, so I grant you that it would appear that we're on the defensive, but that also has to do with, of course, the way the government governs, which is they govern 
uh, by digging around the garbage can instead of determining what they're going to do uh, going forward. And then, of course, from a strategic point of view, I think we are a bit concerned that these folk are adept at stealing other people's ideas. So with an election maybe two, three years away, you go and say, we'd have the policy of doing X. The next thing you know, they appropriate it and they say, oh, it's our policy. So you know, there's a little bit of that. Uh, but uh, let's put it this way. People are working on ideas. Uh, I think that um, there's some uh, work that has to be done, for example, with the shadow cabinet to make sure that it's more active so that the voices aren't, don't seem singular, um, that, uh, that all of the issues are covered. Um, uh, health, for example, is a, is a major one, and uh, you can look forward to Dr. Dalva's presentation about uh, the PLP's position on health and health care uh, coming up in the Senate when, uh, when the debate take place, takes place on the budget. In terms of coverage, media coverage, um, you, you complain often that um, you are not being covered properly. Is the message getting out to the Bahamian people on, on progressive liberal party positions? We are fortunate in this age that we have a fairly cheap means of getting your own message out. Social media. And social media. And that, <clears throat> all the indications we have, the, we did a survey back in February, the first half of February, of the Bahamian people in, in both uh, New Providence and Grand Bahama. And it turns out that uh, social media is the big driver. 74% um, <clears throat> of the people say they get their first brush of news from Facebook, which is the, the, the pollsters said this is the most amazing thing they'd ever seen, mm -hmm. that it's not never been so high in any other country they've been in. So <clears throat> there's that. But what you, ha you have to still um, court the mainstream media because the original drivers of information, because those are official, tied to official sources, uh, tend to be the mainstream media. And so we're trying to work on that uh, to try and not be so um, argumentative uh, to, to actually court individuals in those uh, workplaces uh, and to make ourselves available uh, to answer any questions which people have. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, the, um, the monthly press conference is held by the leader of the party because we wanted to demonstrate a sense of openness and transparency to answer any question about anything that you wanted uh, to hear from the PLP. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mitchell, mm -hmm. talking about openness and transparency, <clears throat> I would say over the last three decades, a political culture has developed in our country, all right? One, there's been a discontinuity of policies, which has uh, retarded our growth and development. And Jones has played a, a, a dissertation by an African fellow uh, who describes the scenario in, in these developing countries as winning the political lottery? All right. And when the PLP wins, when the PLPs govern the country, when the PLPs get the, the honors, all right, when the PLPs get this, when the other fellas win, it's the same thing, right? What, 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 what is your view on that kind of outlook on, 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 on a small developing country like this? Well, I think that it does, in fact, uh, retard growth. And, and what I'm more specifically concerned about is not just the policy directions, because the system is a winner-take-all system. You know, no matter how it even looks in the UK, it's a winner-take-all system. Once you win, that's what happens. In the States, it's a winner-take-all system. But what, uh, what I'm concerned about is that this group that is now in office is developing a reputation for our country that you cannot trust contracts with the government. And a contract is a legally binding document. What they do is they cancel people's contracts with the government. They refuse to pay. And they tell you, we're not going to pay you. 
even though the contract clearly says what the terms are and the contract is binding. And they say, if you want your money, take us to court, knowing that you don't have the resources to do it. So they either beat you down to a price which is underneath your costs, or they don't pay you at all. They say, hard luck. That, so that, that, that disturbs me. Now, the era that we're in is unfortunately becoming even more tribal. And it will be very difficult for our Prime Minister, Philip Davis, to be able to reverse the tide, particularly after this last administration that has been so savage with regard to people who are PLP supporters. And there's going to be a real struggle to try and get some equanimity in a new government which appreciates that all people from all sides can serve a country. But that must be laid at the feet of these folk who are now in power. They have been savage, savage with this stuff and unapologetic with it. And um, you, uh, in terms of the PLP's response to that, um, how have you responded in terms of assisting uh, people uh, who find themselves in, in this difficulty? Well, let's take uh, the Foreign Service officers that were dismissed, uh, um, even though they had a clause in their contract which said that at any point in time, even though they had a contract, they could exercise the right to join the public service. They were dismissed notwithstanding that. They took an action uh, before the Labor Tribunal. It's taken two years and change to actually get before a tribunal, and you still don't have a date today. Mm. And so people's will get sapped after a while because they have to move on, they have to make a living. And this is what I mean. So uh, the, the, the occasional workers who uh, came on the empowerment program, and all of them have been dismissed with the grand promise uh, that the, because supposedly the contracts weren't done well or the records, you know, the, 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 the F&M administration is the most amazing administration. Whenever they come to power, you can't find any paperwork and no one can remember anything. This is the most astounding thing. There's amnesia all around and the paperwork goes missing. Of course, it's right there. It's right there. It's, and it's a selective amnesia. So they dismiss all these people saying, well, we're going to, the, the Minister of Labor got up in the parliament and said, 99% um, of all the people who've been dismissed under this program, they'll be back. Didn't happen. Fiction. Never happened. These people are still off work. And if you go and, and challenge them on it, uh, in the House of Assembly, you've got a Speaker of the House who is so touches, as the old people say. You can't say nothing to that fellow. I mean, he's ridiculous. You know, the freest forum in the country has now become a jail for people uh, who exercise free speech. I mean, I, it was just astounding the other day. He's warning the leader of the opposition, warning the deputy leader of the opposition, warning McAlpine that he's going to defend the, you know, what, what is this? This is a place where you're supposed to be able to talk. You know, it's not, it's not a classroom, uh, so that's what we face. It's a new dispensation. Yeah. Uh, you, you, so you, you are suggesting that uh, this government has been victimizing quite a lot of people. Left, right, and center. Left, right, and center. And unapologetically so. Uh, they can't, they, their view is that the people's time means the F&M time. And anybody who's not dressed in red clothes, later for you. Too bad, too sad, as Ingram used to say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, they said, you know, Ingram and said, said from the hill down to the valley, and that's exactly what they did from day one, and still doing it. And um, when you listen to the average man on the street, what is his response to this? Uh, his response is they're deeply disappointed that what they thought they were going to get is there was this feeling that the Progressive Liberal Party had s sort of forgotten its uh, its supporters and the people at large because there was this view that the bureaucracy moved too slowly, things weren't seeming to get done. But when the government changed, they were simply astounded that these people were just trying to get their greedy mitts on the treasury. That's it. I mean, the most, the, the most obvious example of it is this bold-faced giving of a contract to Brent Simonet. I mean, it's just astounding. Mm -hmm. Astounding. You know, which is going to cost millions of dollars in penalties because they canceled Scott Gadet's contract, which is again a contract, solemn contract with the government. They cancel it and they give it to Brent Simonet. 
a minister of the government who says, don't worry, I stepped out of the room when we, when we passed it, right? Then sits in the house and watches over all of the members of parliament, you know, some of them, no doubt, his, uh, his campaign money is supporting, uh, vote aye, aye, sir. Th this, is, this is ludicrous in a country. And so that's, we, we have to keep pointing it out and we have to keep saying it over and over again. I think people down at the bottom understand that that's what this has happened. The people's time does not mean the people in the generic sense. It only means some people and those people who are the elites who run the FNM. Not even all FNMs are equal. Messaging, um, Mr. Mitchell, is extremely important. And some of these things uh, uh, I'm hearing uh, as, you, as you speak. Uh, is the message getting out to the average um, voter as far as you're concerned? The PLB message, is, is it getting out? Well, I think, st I think there's still in the, in the mainstream media significant pushback against mm. the message. There's pushback but, against the message. Oh, yeah. I mean, in the, in the mainstream media. Okay. There's, there's a lot of pushback. But uh -huh. I think we are getting in the social, through the social media platforms, we're managing. Now, we, we have an issue of resources, you know, and I get plenty of advice. I try and keep in touch with my donors. Uh, I do this full time now. Uh, so fundraising is, a, is an issue because social media it cannot be managed by volunteers. You know, you're going to need money to manage social media. This is a professional thing that has to be done. So I use this platform today to say to donors that it is very important that the political party that you support gets the support. And I think these, these folk have been generous in the face of some withering, you know, criticism of their support of us. Mm. And they've been very generous. And I'm deeply grateful for that support. Mm. But, it, you know, we have to... We have to have the ammunition to fight. You know, the Americans say uh, there are two rules in politics. Number one is the mother's milk of politics is money. Mm. Number two is see rule number one. Uh, you you um, mentioned Mr. Simonet just now, uh, and uh, there I've seen press releases from the PLP complaining about special interests uh, in in the Bahamas, uh, and these special interests, uh, the PLP. Uh, uh, you're saying that they are very powerful, they have money, uh, that they seek to control things uh, in the Bahamas. How are you going to undo this um, with all of the money that the special interests uh, would have and the power that they have? Well, I think tax policy is the way to deal with it. You know, I, I'm, I'm in, in favor of an aggressive tax policy at these monopolies that have been, exi that have been allowed to uh, happen in our country, to tell them it has to be broken up or the tax policy will be used to break it up. That's my view. And, you know, this is stuff, of course, you have to decide uh, within uh, a caucus that, you know, what are the official policies going to be. But, uh, for example, we see the group has got their eyes now on Morgan's Bluff. You know, Andros is going to be the place, which is the breadbasket of our country. If you want to get shipping in and out of there, the only place that's, uh, that's suitable for that now is Morgan's Bluff. That's a deep water port. It's already been uh, investments heavily by the government. And if you know the F&M, they've got someone in mind that they're going to hand that off to and create a monopoly for this port going into Andros. That, the PLP, must do everything in its power to fight and to stop and to be, to be sure that this, the ownership of that port remains in the hands of the people of the Bahamas. You just have to go back to where we are now, for example, with BTC. I mean, we, we, the people of Bahamas built up all that equity in BTC as they built up equity in the Prince George Wharf and the port. And now you go and hand it off to a select few people. And BTC, if you look at that, I mean, it was, it was just a fire sale. And what have we got? We've got a telephone and telecommunications system which is worse than it has ever been. Overcrowding, dropped calls. We don't know when the next level of investment is going to take place. Telecommunications policy is in a shambles. IRCA is impotent to do anything, it appears. 
Uh, no one, of course, and this is one of the areas I'm trying to search around for the Progressive Liberal Party, is someone from the Progressive Liberal Party ought to be speaking to telecommunications and data policy, information policy, because we're switching to 5G. Where are we? Who's going to make the investment? When is this going to be done? Uh, and all of that dates back to this bad decision to sell BTC to this group that immediately flipped it at a high price to another group, and now they are seeking to flip it and losing, losing Bahamian jobs all the way. So to the point is, you now, I understand, going to soon be ringing BTC in the Bahamas, and the phone call is going to be answered in Kingston. Let's take a break here. This is our program, uh, Jones and Company. Our guest, Senator Fred Mitchell, the chairman of the Progressive Liberal Party. We'll come right back. We're back here on our program, Jones and Company, and uh, Senator Fred Mitchell, our guest. Godfrey? Mr. Mitchell, here again. Uh, I, I listened to Mendel's two, two programs, and this is cry about taxes from the corporate community and from the general citizenry. And uh, one gentleman called no longer on Friday talking about the reason for the high cost of food. It isn't, it isn't a fact that the duty is on it. It's because of that. What, 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 what is the, the PLP's position on, 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 on taxation? Well, <laughs> clearly, we said that Peter Turnquist failed math class or economics class, something he failed, because his calculation and that of his staff at the, foreign, uh, at the finance ministry seemed to be that if the tax is 7.5% and you want to collect 60% more, you raise the tax by 60% and you'll get 60% more. Economics 101 tells you that any time you impose a cost that the demand curve shifts inward. So people immediately start to cut back. And that's what they found. So he can't even make his own predictions. So clearly taxes have been a retardant to the growth of a consumer economy. And why is the stress on consumer economy so important? Because we are not a manufacturing country and revenue is driven by consumption you have to do things if you want to increase your revenue you have to do things to increase consumption when you do things to retard consumption then your tax revenue is going to fall and the government as the main uh, generator of income and revenue in this country sets the example for everybody else so when businesses see that the government is cutting back when businesses see that the government is laying off they do the same. In the meantime, the tax has actually increased the price of goods and services. So everything becomes more expensive. And then you have this downward spiral of, of revenue falling, falling, falling. And each year you keep saying, we're going to do, we're going to do better. So as a general rule, I think the, the leader of the opposition has said, he has to look, we have to look at the situation when we actually get there. But I think as a general rule, you can expect that there has to be some movement to ease the tax burden on the Bahamian public under a PLP administration. Well, you know, one, one of the arguments that the FNM put forward was that the deficit was spiraling out of control because of overspending by the, the previous administration and, the, and various administrations Oh, since, since, since 2000. Yes, I, I understand Mr. Turncrest's argument is that he is the best Minister of Finance in the history of the country, bar none, and that everybody else didn't know what they were doing. Except that the facts don't show that. What the facts show is that all of the deficit predictions were on track until we had those hurricanes. And it's only the hurricanes that are responsible for blowing the deficit predictions out of, out of whack. And in any event, I don't understand what all this preoccupation is with borrowing. You, a developing country has to borrow. You don't have the capital, so you have to borrow. 
and the, if you borrow and you put it in the right place, it will generate income. You know, Bob Ma showed you that. That, you know, you invest in something, it creates jobs, it creates activity. You know, I was in uh, Florida with some friends of mine, Miami Beach, uh, last evening. And multi-story buildings, 20 stories or more. It's construction. And I said to him, you know, construction is what drives this economy. And the story has been always in the Bahamas that when the economy of the United States, in particular when South Florida's land economy, and land development is going at a clip pace. The spillover comes to the Bahamas. And the question we have to ask ourselves with, I spoke about Freeport at the start. Why, for example, with this boom going on in Florida now? It happened under the Christie years when the boom took place in Florida. The spillover came to Grand Bahama. The boom is now going on in Florida. There's no spillover in Grand Bahama today. None. Why? Why? There must be some, something that's off. And the same thing here in New Providence, there's no construction going on. I tell people, if you want to see the magic of construction, go to Marsh Harbor on a Friday when those construction workers come from Baker's Bay onto the mainland on payday on a Friday afternoon. The town is jumping, is jumping. The food stores, the liquor stores, you know, I say the first thing you do is after you get your cash, your, your check cashed, is you give your girlfriend, your wife, you know, her money, and then you go out on a binge. And we know that people in the lowest socioeconomic groups, very little saving. They spend everything. So they drive the economy. And yet, this government is doing everything to try and prevent that by allowing costs to rise. And this preoccupation about deficits, which is just a nonsense. So, so when the government says that the <clears throat> economy uh, grew by 1.6 percent, and uh, oh, they 1.6 percent. Yeah, yes, they say it grew by 1.6 percent, yeah, okay. and uh, they uh, point to to billions of dollars in promised um, investment. Mm. What do you say? Promise is a comfort to a fool. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen it. And I saw the former minister of tourism was in the press today saying, you know, same thing that I was saying put some cash on the ground in Grand Bahama. You know, the 65 million, now almost 100 million you spent saying you're trying to save this hotel. Months and months have gone by. Nothing we could see right now that's perceptible that, uh, that has improved a lot on the ground in Grand Bahama. There's a need for a cash injection. I think people are slowly realizing it, that, you know, you have to lubricate the system. Whatever they're talking about is going to take two years to ramp up in Grand Bahama. You know, meantime, you know, things are going from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. You know, people, uh, people have issues trying to find food. Now, that's a major issue, trying to find food, something to eat. Um, transportation is hugely expensive. You go down to the dock in Grand Bahama and people are packing up on the Betty Kay and coming to Nassau. And so all of the social issues which you're finding in, uh, finding in New Providence now are becoming more intense because of it. So, uh, you know, you have to find uh, the government, again, is the only one that can actually m put together the resources to try and lubricate the systems we have. And they're just not doing it. Just this total preoccupation with deficits and cutting back and laying off and it isn't getting us anywhere. But, but meanwhile, um, <clears throat> Mr. Mitchell, um, because I have to put the, the government's point of view to you uh, in the interest of fairness, Godfrey, uh, the Minister of Tourism uh, says that we've had unprecedented growth in uh, tourist arrivals in the Bahamas. Uh, we've seen the air, B and B, um, market uh, doing extremely well, that tourism is working, especially in New Providence, in Exuma, and in a few other places. Well, no thanks to him, you know, because he would have left to him, the whole thing would have been dead. Remember, he fought tooth and nail to make sure the Bahama didn't succeed, but now he's Tourism Minister of the Year because Bahama has succeeded. And every time you say that to them, they say, yeah, but you know, the figures are 
better at Atlantis and all around, so it's not just Bahama. But the question is, what is the driver of it? The driver of it is that brand new project out west. That's the driver of it. So yes, the figures are going. But, but now, here's the issue. Here's the issue. We need to start investing in new projects. I tell people, you know, I've never been to the Miami International Airport at any time when there's not construction going on at Miami International Airport. There's always something new happening, mm -hmm. and it's long overdue. The airport is clearly inadequate here in New Providence, clearly inadequate, and needs to be ramped up bigger. New runway needs to be done. Uh, the airports in the islands, North Eleuthera, clearly needs to be done. Exuma is clearly inadequate. And now, this is now year two. This is, good. This is their third budget. Uh, and we still no closer to seeing shovels in the ground. So one thing we told these folks, Minister of Tourism included, is you will find that when you make a decision in the cabinet of the Bahamas to say we are going to build that building, from the time that decision takes place to the first shovel in the ground is three years. So you're now in the middle of your term, and you're just talking about making these decisions to do these things. So you will find yourself hard up on the heels of a general election, trying to ramp up and make sure that the shovel gets in the ground to say, this is what I'm going to do in my next term. Well, you know, God be praised, they don't have that opportunity, and as someone else, namely the progressive. Mr. Mitchell, and it, it is said that, that, that the... Uh the central bank is awash with liquidity, mm. Bahamian dollars. Mm. All right. Will the PLP uh, uh, encourage domestic investment, or, or will the program still be uh, leaning towards heavy dependence on foreign direct investment? Well, I think uh, foreign direct investment obviously is going to have to be a, a, a component of, of this because of the way, uh, the way the economy actually works. And I, I think uh, James Smith um, has spoken to this issue because part of the reason why we're so awash in cash is the government made a decision to go and borrow U.S. dollars instead of borrowing from the domestic economy. Now, the macroeconomists have to discuss the whys and wherefores of that, but that's one of the reasons why it's bumped up the way it is. And what he said when uh, they last went to the international markets to get the $750 million in U.S., and I see they're going to borrow another 82 in, in U.S. again, so it'll go into the reserves, is that what you're doing is you're creating a bubble. And since there's nothing to do, the government isn't finding anything to do with the money here in projects in the Bahamas, eventually the banks are going to have to find something to do with it. So they start doing stupid things like uh, approving a $20,000 credit for you to have a credit card, you know, and charging you 20% interest, which is a complete waste of the resources. So yes, I think there has to be a shift. And what is ex especially painful to me, and I, I've indicated in our internal caucus that we ought to set aside $250 million uh, in a venture capital fund to try and get small and medium enterprises uh, started here. There's, a, there's a, uh, a, a, an entrepreneur now who is trying to get um, a business approved by the uh, authorities in road traffic. And, just having a devil of a time trying to get the approvals, but the main issue is the money. Where do you get the capital for this? And so we have to work on that because going forward, um, it's clear it's not going to be business as usual in the sense that you just come out of the workforce, you join Jones Communications, for example, and you work here for 40 years. You know, that's not going to happen in the future. So everybody's going to have to, you know, stand on their own. Uh, the, the tub is going to have, each tub has to be on its own bottom. And so policy clearly has to be designed. Mr. Mitchell, this country has not done well in the globalization era. From 2000, our economy has been in decline. Still in decline. Still in decline, yeah. All right. And one of the reasons why we are in this predicament. All right. It's because the country lacks rejuvenation, reinvention, 
All right. We've been, we've been, we've been sailing with this services economic model for the last 70 years. All right. And I am, I am concerned because uh, you people talk about bringing young people into the, to the government. All right. It's fine. But where's the experience? Wait, let me finish now. Mm -hmm. And a big part of the problem is Bahamians do not know the Bahamas, sir. That's the problem. One of them amongst, um, amongst many. But you know, uh, uh, Brother Ineas, it's this. The younger people, um, just through a fluxion of time, the country is theirs. So ain't no point complaining about them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's the future. And whatever they are, they are that because of us. And so we have to work, we have to work with them. And that means they got to be with us every step of the way. And you were talking about they're not interested in history. I mean, you know, so you tell them the little stories and so on and so forth. And they get it, you know. Eventually, I think they get it. Uh, I think that when you talk to uh, young people, they want to launch off into the deep. They often don't know how to do it. Um, I think you just have to shepherd them through it. And, but my, my basic philosophy, and, and I got this really from Bernard, late Bernard Nottage, you know, you say you can't throw up your hands and say, you know, young people. You, you just can't do it. You, no, 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 you, get me right now. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not knocking young people. I'm just knocking the lack of experience. All right? But, and, but they, have a, they have a compelling argument that the opportunities are not given to get the experience. You see, Here's, here's what we're working on in the Progressive Liberal Party. A political party must be able to use your, your um, arguments to generate itself or regenerate itself in every generation. So you've got to try, uh, Grafton Eiffel told me this about the police force, you've got to try and get your set from every birth cohort. So every crew that comes out of school every year, some of them got to be PLPs. And we have to make sure that we get them, because they're the ones who are going to move the country forward, to learn the PLP, to learn the message of, our, of, of the, the Afrocentricity of our country and the directions that we want to take it in, uh, the nationalism of the country, all of that. So every year we have to do that and bring them along in the project and not be afraid. I mean, uh, uh, Kofi Annan said that he thought that governments ought to actually make a specific commitment that 10 percent of every economic project had to have people under 25 involved in it as a matter of law and statute you may not want to go that far i bet he said that after he left the u.n no he was he was u.n secretary general no i said I, he said that after he left the u.n no no he was secretary that, was, general. that wasn't part of the u.n policy no he was u.n secretary general 2006. no no i am saying but that was not yeah. part of the u.n policy yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to finish the thought, so I'm saying that all of us just have to commit ourselves to that, have to commit ourselves to that, to give them the opportunity, right, to get the experience. That's, that's my, you know, my argument. Mr. Mr. Mitchell, at the end of the day, it's about the economy. Yeah. For young people and not so young people. Yeah, it's the economy. It's the economy. Yeah. Um, the Prime Minister um, says that... Um, there are going to be a number of projects coming on stream very soon. Yeah, God bless um, <laughs> The city is going to change. It's going to be a new central bank, he says, a new Supreme Court. The Americans are going to build an embassy. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you, and there's uh, going to be some super highways. Uh, Gladstone Road will have four lanes, he said. Uh, the rest of T Tanique Darling Highway or Harold Road from uh, Bethel Avenue moving to JFK, it would be widened. It sounds as though the government has some big plans. Yes, plans and it, plans. Should, it, should, it should change the, the feel of the country and the, and the economy, shouldn't it? Well, let's use that poem. The best laid plans of mice and men often go aglay. So we wish them luck. You know, God bless them. But so far it's all been talk. Uh, and we will see. It sounds like you are wishing for a crop failure. No, no. You, you, no, you, you don't. No, I, that's, what I, that's what I said. God bless him. God bless him. 
you, you don't think it's going to happen? We will w watch and see. We'll watch and see. We'll do everything to assist this economy to develop and to make sure these young people have a stake in the country. Uh, what, you know, I, I, I just, there's a neighborhood that I went in. This family built a brand new house. And six months or so after the brand new house was completed, they got permission to emigrate to Canada. And they closed the house, packed up, and left. And that is the story that unfortunately we hear, hear too often. Uh, so the promises are fine, the plans are fine, but the tribalism continues, and we need the help of all people. So we'll do our part to be sure that the country develops, but there must be equity across the board. The people at the bottom must feel it, and not just the elites at the top. And that is the danger that we see. And as you move around, um, how do you assess the mood of, of, of the people? You've been to most of the islands and most of the constituencies, because uh, I believe you're seeking to build branches and to keep Everywhere, them moving. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you assess the mood of the people? Well, I'll tell you, the 11-year-old girl who spoke to me in primary school said, she said, uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, when is the general election going to be? And I said, well, not for a few years. She says, well, I hope it comes quick because these people, they make it no sense. Thank you so very much. Okay. Thank you for being here today, <laughs> Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Godfrey Inez. Thank you. Uh, thank you for watching and listening to our program. Good evening, everyone.